Oh, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. George, for that generous introduction. The only shortcoming of it was that it makes me sound very old to have done all those things. <laughs> I want to uh, start by suggesting that the message that the Pope will bring uh, to the United States uh, is well understood uh, by anybody who visits a small um, Jesuit high school in Detroit, Christo Ray High School. Um, if you go there, in the math classroom, there is this picture of the Pope sending a dove aloft. In the art room, a picture of him with a lamb draped around his shoulders. In the Spanish language room, a picture of him with a sombrero. And elsewhere in the school, there are photos of him with a parrot and with his thumbs up. And there is one formal Vatican official uh, portrait of the pontiff. Now these photos haven't been assembled by the students or by the staff. They were sent to the school by the Pope. And so uh, they tell you something about how he sees himself in this context. He sent them because he was apologising to the school. They had hoped to be part of the virtual audience that he held recently and he couldn't include them. He included their sister school in Chicago. It, ahead of coming to uh, the US, he was very aware that he was only going to be on the East Coast in a few places and there were lots of parts of the states he wasn't going to get to. So he held this uh, two-way conversation with three cities that he can't get to in person. And the images that he sent them give a revealing cr clue as to the priorities of this up coming visit, because to date the media focus has been on the formal events, uh, meeting the President in the White House, uh, addressing uh, both Houses of Congress, going to the UN General Assembly. Uh, um, these are public venues where his remarks will be carefully crafted uh, with the help of the uh, Vatican Secretary of State. But the Pope has no fewer than five audiences uh, on this visit. One is the, the official uh, political elite, uh, the other is the world political elite at the UN. He's going to be addressing US bishops. He's going to be talking primarily to American Catholics and the American people more generally. But he's also aware that he will be listened to by the wider world. And his remarks are for all of those audiences. So this selection of photographs, warm and humorous, direct and personal, uh, show his emphasis is going to be primarily on engaging with ordinary people rather than those national and international elites. In that virtual audience on ABC television, he spoke with students in Chicago, the homeless in Los Angeles, and Im immigrants on the US-Mexico border uh, in uh, McClellan, Texas. And what they saw was the Pope up close and personal. So what did we learn from that encounter of the Pope? First, that his primary concern is with those who have struggled or whose success is measured in unconventional terms within the American dream. This is Valerie Herrera, a 17-year-old girl with a rare skin condition, which led to her being bullied at school. And she broke down in tears as she told her story to the Pope, and she also told him how she had sought solace in music. And in response, unexpectedly, the Pope asked her in his hesitant English, may I ask of you to sing a song for me? And uh, she was uh, very nervous and didn't want to do it. He said, be courageous. And that message, be courageous, was a message that he repeated to the homeless youth from Los Angeles and the refugee girl from El Salvador. Be courageous, God is with you. And then a struggling single mom uh, Rosemary Farfan, with her two daughters in Los Angeles, also broke down in tears as she described how difficult her life had been and how she had made a lot of wrong decisions along the way. And Rosemary um, said that she'd never made the right choices and she was extraordinarily tearful. Uh, in this next photograph, she's not tearful because the Pope told her that she was a brave woman. She had brought two daughters into the world. She was doing her best. Uh, and she could have had an abortion, but she didn't. She'd brought them into the world. 
Now, that story struck me for several reasons. The Pope's primary concern when he comes to the US is going to be to be a pastor. That's what he is everywhere in the world. And he wants to affirm ordinary people in their struggles to do the right thing. But there's a number of hidden subtexts in this. One is that implicit in the Pope's words uh, were the message of the church that abortion is a grave wrong. And yet he was conveying that not through condemning or, or, or um, uh, being judgmental. It was a mes message of, of compassion rather than condemnation uh, for this woman, an arm around the shoulder, as it were, rather than a wagging finger. So that gives you an indication of how multi-layered the Pope's gestures are. He's a political operator of some sophistication, and you need to bear that in mind when he comes here, uh, when you watch how to read him. In that ABC 2020 news program, there was another interesting exception. And this next picture is a nun called Norma Pimentel. She wasn't supposed to be part of the audience with the Pope, but the Pope spotted her in the crowd and he said to the anchor, I'd like to talk to that nun. And he called her out and uh, she stood in front of, of him and he um, praised her, he showered her with really lavish and unconditional praise for the work that she, and he said very pointedly, all US nuns do among the poor. I want to thank you, said Francis, and through you thank all the sisters of religious orders for the work you've done and that you continue to do in the United States. It's great, I congratulate you. Be courageous again, move forward. And again, there was a subtext here which was unmistakable. This was Francis indicating uh, very publicly that it was he who had brought to an abrupt end earlier this year the two investigations which had been going on into US nuns by the Vatican. And he was indicating to those who'd objected to the work of the nuns, saying that they were spending too much time uh, working with the poor and not enough time campaigning against abortion. He was indicating that he uh, was on the side of the sisters in that debate. Move forward, he told Sister Norma and all US nuns. And this is an interesting echo of, of, of what happened when he met Latin American nuns very early in his uh, uh, pontificate. They, uh, the nuns took notes to pass on to the rest of their order and somebody put them on a website, which is not what the Pope intended. But it was interesting what he said. Uh, he was talking about what would happen if they got another letter from the Vatican doctrinal watchdog, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, censuring them. He said to them, perhaps even a letter from the Congregation of the Doctrine will arrive for you, telling you you said such and such, but do not worry, explain whatever you have to explain and move forward. Open the doors, do something where life calls for it. And in this um, American TV um, audience, he went even further. He said, I'll tell you another thing. And he said, it's, is it appropriate for the Pope to say this? But I love you all very much. And one prominent nun uh, in the US said to me uh, afterwards uh, a single word in response to that, which was, whoa. <laughs> a clear message on a number of levels, uh, a, a number of messages on a number of levels in that, in that one audience. Uh, this tactical savvy, political savvy uh, of the Popes was on display in two other eve of visit initiatives which he launched. One was on abortion and one was on annulment. Uh, in his announcement that this coming year of mercy which he's declared, um, all priests will be authorised to forgive women who express contrition for abortions. And this was a bold gesture but a tactically astute one for a reason I'll just explain. He was sending a, a, a clear message that uh, God's Forgiveness is unconditional. He wasn't changing the Catholic teaching one jot that abortion is a grave sin, but he was signalling uh, his sympathy for women uh, who had made the decision to abort the child inside them. And he was saying he appreciated that this would have been, for many of them, an existential and moral ordeal. And he said, I'm well aware of the pressure that has led them to this decision. Now, conservative... Uh, people sm uh, smelled a kind of doctrinal slackness in that. 
But there were two things that he did which, re, which wrong-footed uh, the conservative criticism. First, he wasn't changing doctrine. He was changing procedure. He was acting pastorally rather than doctrinally. And he was able to have his supporters point out that St. John Paul II, uh, the conservative's favourite pope, had done something similar during his holy year in the millennium. And Pope Benedict had done the same in 2011 on World Youth Day. But he did something else which was very unexpected. The power to absolve sins in the confessional was extended by Pope Francis to ultra-conservative traditionalists known as Lefebvreists from uh, the Society of, of Pius X. They'd broken away from Rome in 1998 over the Second Vatican Council, which they didn't recognize, and they'd ordained their own bishops uh, illicitly. In response, Rome had said it didn't recognize their ministry. And now here was Francis, who is often perceived as a liberal, uh, embracing these most conservative of figures uh, and saying that um, their ministry was recognized in the sacrament of penance throughout Holy Year. And again, this move was double-edged because on the one hand, it could be seen as a, um, an olive branch to the traditionalists, but it could also just be seen as an insistence that in a jubilee year of mercy, God's mercy is available to all. And there was another point which struck me as a more subtle subtext even. He was yoking together two things which in the Catholic Church bring automatic excommunication if they're committed. One is abortion, but the other is schism. So he was, he was wrong-footing people who were going to criticise this right from the outset while still making this dramatic gesture of clemency. So like, rather like his famous who am I to judge comment on gay Catholics, what he, his move was orthodox in doctrine, but it was revolutionary in the semiotics and the, the signals that it sent. A public gesture, a big public gesture of compassion, which is clear, but moving away from the area of doctrine and rules and signaling that Francis wants the church to develop an emotional intelligence uh, so that women who've been alienated from the church by an abortion uh, can feel comfortable in returning. And the, the, the kind of judgment which had hung over them like a sword of Damocles in the past had been replaced by this signal of clemency. And one woman put it, what he was saying to us is, you won't be judged, you'll be forgiven, we'll work through this with you and we'll support you. So again, a very multi-layered uh, piece of political psychology. The next thing which I want to just say before we move on to the main substance of, of uh, the Pope's take, uh, uh, message is this announcement he's made on annulment. Uh, Catholic Church teaches that marriage is indissoluble, divorce is not permitted, but annulment, which is sometimes seen by the secular media as a Catholic form of divorce, Catholics insist is no, it's not a divorce, it's just an assertion that the marriage was never valid in the first place. People have different views on uh, the ethical value of that. But in the book, I report that several people who were summoned privately to speak to Francis on this issue of whether people who ha have been remarried can, can take communion within the church, which is, is banned at the moment. Uh, Francis wants to change that. And he told the, the people uh, that he spoke to privately that he wants change. Uh, and they, they told me that. I'm convinced that is the case. In the Synod of Bishops, which he called, he made this a kind of central issue. And what happened was that the bishops divided into two camps, people who thought this was compassionate pastorally and people who thought it was doctrinally wrong and philosophically imprecise. So Francis was unfazed by that. He said that the bishops haven't really divided into two camps. They were divided pre, in a pre-existing way anyway, and it was just papered over in previous, under previous popes. And it's much healthier if these things are out in the open. Let's get the resistance out in the open. That's more healthy, he said afterwards. Now, during this last synod, which was last October, um, one commonly proposed solution to how are we going to cope with this divide between these two sides was, well, let's make annulments a lot easier. And that is what Francis has just unilaterally announced. 
And some commentators, like John Allen in the Boston Globe, who's a, a, a very perspicacious observer of the Vatican, he concluded that this move was uh, uh, an attempt by Francis to shift the debate in the next synod, which is coming next month uh, in Rome, uh, into other areas. Uh, it, it's a fait accompli that he's done this on annulment now, so we can talk about other things. Um, I'm not convinced that's right, because uh, already more conservative members of the church, like uh, the US Cardinal Raymond Burke, have begun to uh, object to the detail of these annulment changes. Um, it seems to me that Francis may intend exactly the opposite of that. He may want to remove the idea that this debate can just end with speeding up annulments. In the Catholic Church in the United States, only a quarter of people with failed marriages apply for annulments anyway. Perhaps a few more would if the procedure was uh, easier, quicker, cheaper. But it seems to me the, to be the case that people have other reservations about uh, the ethics uh, of annulments. And uh, three quarters of them um, don't see annulment as, as the avenue uh, which will uh, bring them more completely into the, the, the life of the church. Um, and the Pope is clearly, to me, of that view. He t thinks particularly it, that what happens for the children of such marriages, that they lose their contact, their full contact, or their complete contact with the church because their parents don't feel comfortable in it. So it seems to me that the, the Pope's intention here may be to sharpen the debate rather than to fudge a compromise. So from this, this abortion and this annulment uh, eve of visit announcements, I think you see that the, 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 you, when, he, when he comes here, you should watch when he speaks and, and through his gestures and the people that he, he meets, you should watch to see beyond the first obvious meaning and to look for counterpoint, look for ambiguity, look for subtexts. So that's the prelude to what I wanted to say. This shrewd symmetry on, on uh, the Pope's part is something that was there when he was Archbishop in Buenos Aires and it's been there uh, all the way through the first two years of him being Pope. When he arrived in, in the job two years ago, the big question that a lot of people ask is, is he a liberal or is he a conservative? And what I've concluded in, in, in the book is that, that that was the wrong question to ask because Francis has in no way altered Catholic doctrine and in that sense he is a conservative and yet change is clearly in the air, the way things are done. Um, somebody said that the words are the same but the music is altered. I think it's actually more complicated than that. But one of the things that is characteristic about him is that he's got this very adroit sense of balance between continuity and change. And that's been part of his modus operandi from the outset. So, an example. Pope Benedict, his predecessor, left him with a very staunchly conservative um, body of uh, officials in, in the Roman bureaucracy, which is called the Curia. Um, he, the, he also left... Um, the, uh, on the rail tracks in a way which was um, inevitably going to happen whether Francis liked it or not and I, I've got no reason to suppose he didn't like it but he had made his, the previous Pope, John Paul II um, a saint uh, in a, and it was just a question of the, the, the ceremony um, being carried out Fr Francis could see that uh, there was a temptation for some people to see that what was being canonised here was not the life of John Paul, but the papacy. And the papacy was um, a conservative papacy which a lot of people felt uh, unhappy about. So Francis's solution to this was to accelerate the canonization of another pope, John XXIII, who was widely seen as a liberal figure. So this was a wily balancing act on the pope's part. He'd taken two figures who were emblem emblematic of a conservative and a more liberal approach to the church, and he was canonizing them both on the same day. It's a kind of politics of equilibrium. And John XXIII himself summed that up nicely when he said, I have to be Pope for both those who have their foot on the gas and those who have their foot on the brake. And that striving for balance is part of why the Pope is going to Cuba before he comes to the United States. 
Uh, in part, he's going to Cuba as an endorsement of the role that he played in, in brokering the, the talks last year between Washington and Havana, which ended five decades of stalemate and the last remnant of the, of the Cold War. But it's more than that, because the United States and Cuba are kind of totems which stand for the rich world and the poor world. And Francis is very keen to be seen to not embrace one without embracing the other. So in a few days before he arrives, he's going to be saying mass in... Um, sorry, I missed a slide out there. Uh, in Havana, in Revolution Square, next to this giant portrait of Che Guevara. And just a few weeks ago, when he was in Bolivia, he accepted a, a hammer and sickle crucifix from the left-wing president there. Uh, and all of this will compound uh, the idea amongst some uh, conservatives that the Pope is some kind of communist. Um, one American diplomat said to, to, to a British diplomat in, uh, uh, in Rome recently, the Holy Father is not exactly making things easy for us. The Pope's not bothered. Balance is his key consideration. And I'll give you two examples of how he's done this in the past uh, two years. One is within the church, one is outside. Inside the church, as I said, this, this staunchly conservative uh, hierarchy and bureaucracy uh, he, that he inherited from, from Benedict. What he did with that is that he removed some individuals who he saw as intransigent. Um, Cardinal Burke uh, the, uh, uh, was, was the, uh, on the key body that appointed bishops. He was also head of the um, Vatican Supreme Court, and um, the Pope removed him. But the other man in the picture is Cardinal Muller. He's, the, he's equally conservative, and he's the head of the doctrine body in the church. He's left him in. He's not seen as obstructive by the Pope. The Pope thinks he's a team player. He thinks that Cardinal Burke is not a team player. So an interesting bit of balance within how you deal with a single group like the conservative uh, um, group in the, in the hierarchy. Uh, the external example is, is the uh, visit to the Holy Land. The popes uh, dramatically boosted the um, aspirations of Palestinians by praying apparently spontaneously at the separation wall that cuts off Bethlehem from Israel. But then the next day, again unexpectedly, he very movingly kissed the hands of Holocaust survivors and stopped to pray at the memorial for Israeli victims of suicide bombers. So when he comes to the US, expect the same kind of balance. He's seeing the president, the Congress, the UN, but he's, he's also going to see homeless people in DC. He's going to meet underprivileged third graders in East Harlem. He's going to minister to uh, inmates in a Philadelphia correctional facility. So the grand stage balanced with uh, the, the poor and the outcasts. And the, the, the key thing here is this is a pope who instinctively sees the world from the bottom up, and that's a lens through which you have to watch his behaviour when he arrives. It's worth saying, having pointed out all these examples of balance, that balance is not the same thing as compromise, and he's been very ready to challenge people he sees and systems that he sees as falling short. So if he's doctrinally orthodox but pastorally revolutionary, He's really radical in the area of economics. In the run-up to his visit, the, the, the Pope's popularity has fallen off quite significantly uh, in, in US opinion polls. I mean, some people have suggested they're just outliers, exceptions, but, but the, the figures are quite dramatic. In the last Gallup poll, um, among Catholics, his popularity dropped from 89% to 71%, almost 20% drop among Americans in general, down from 76% to 59%, according to Gallup. Uh, another 20% dropped nearly. Amongst conservative Catholics, he dropped almost 30%, from 72% to 45%. And the pollsters say it's pretty clear that the, um, the fall is, it comes after the hard line that the Pope has taken on uh, the excesses of global capitalism and the indifference of the free market to poor people and a polluted planet. Certainly in the document um, in which set out his manifesto, his kind of mission statement, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he said some radical things. He said that the worship of the ancient golden calf had returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money. 
he got very specific. He said the theory of trickle down, if the rich do well, it trickles down to the poor. It doesn't work in practice. It does, it, it's not, there's no proof of that. Inequality is the root of social ills. The powerful feed on the power, powerless. Rich people are stealing if they do not share their wealth with the poor. So you can see why uh, a lot of people looked at that and said that's a kind of Marxism. The Pope doesn't agree. He says that's the gospel. And again, this is a Pope from the global south who sees the world through different eyes. And when his um, document uh, on the environment, Laudato Si, was published, The Poor Church for the Poor, this document uh, was, was billed by everybody as a document about global warming. Uh, when it came, it had very uh, far-reaching economic, uh, sorry, um, environmental analysis of pollution and uh, uh, desertification and uh, despolation and a whole, whole range of things. But despite that, the day that it was announced, the Pope said privately to his advisors in uh, Rome, this document is not a, uh, an environmental document, it's a social document. Because global warming, in his view, is a symptom of a, a deeper problem that the rich world's exploitation of the environment is rooted in the same problem that, of the rich world's indifference to poor people, which is that the pursuit of short-term economic gain puts profit before both people and the planet. And Laudato Si was very blunt. It said, this economy kills. So what you got there was not an ecological or environmental analysis, but one which was social, economic, morals and spiritual, most importantly. Uh, he was saying that our consumerist uh, throwaway society is feeding global warming and destroying the planet. Now, this inches Catholic social teaching forward into new territory because in the past, popes had been critical of the uh, uh, excesses of global capitalism when it was irresponsible and unrestrained. Um, and people had talked about, popes had talked about uh, the poor being oppressed or exploited. But Francis was saying something new. He wasn't talking about exploitation. He was talking about exclusion. And he says what we've got now with a, the, our present economic system is not people who are on the fringes of society or disenfranchised, but people who actually aren't a part of it anymore. They're not exploited, but they're outcast, they're leftovers, and he calls it the economy of exclusion. And he says that behind this uh, rejection of those individuals who uh, are unable to even participate in the global economy, those people who are thrown away, as he puts it, there lurks, and this is a quote, a rejection of ethics and a rejection of God. So you get some indication from that of what, about what uh, uh, irritates uh, and concerns conservatives about the Pope. Both John Paul and Benedict had made similar statements about economic uh, issues in keeping with the Catholic tradition which looks at the relationship between people and money uh, ever since the Industrial Revolution. But John Paul and Benedict, it was just part of a wider portfolio. Their main concerns were elsewhere. But this is a, a Pope who wants a poor church for the poor. And so he's not going to let the rich off the hook on economics. So what I think conservatives don't like about Francis is that he, he takes this stuff seriously. They think he actually means it. And because he lives, uh, because he comes from a, a tradition where he's worked, he was called the Bishop of the Slums. He worked for 20 years in the slums. He's got a, a real idea of the lived experience of, of poverty. That gives him a passion which previous popes lack, lacked on this, which is unnerving people. One uh, of his aides told me, Benedict was an academic who wrote books and hoped they would persuade by reason, but F Francis knows how to sell his ideas. He's engaged in the political marketplace. And that became clear in, uh, when the Pope went to Bolivia this summer, where he got that hammer and sickle crucifix. He gave his most ferocious denunciation of capitalism to date. So what we're seeing a Pope, he seems to be getting more fierce in his language uh, as time goes by. It was more than a denunciation this time in Bolivia. It was a kind of call to arms. And that was where he said that behind all the pain, death and destruction brought by unrestrained global capitalism lies the stench of the dung of the devil. 
So very, very strong language. Constantly talking about an unfettered pursuit of money. Uh, it's not money that's evil, it's the love of money. Uh, the service of the common good is left behind. And what was particularly striking about this was that his address was made to a collection of community and political activists. And he said to them, the future of humanity is in your hands. Let us not be afraid to say it. We want change, real change, structural change. This system is now intolerable. And he spoke to them for an hour in a speech that was written entirely by him, not by anybody else. And in that, he called for this kind of radical change no fewer than 30 times. And he said, it's got to come from community activists. It won't come from great leaders or great powers or the elite. And he said, it's about giving to the poor what's theirs by right. So you can see why people uh, are starting to say that he's Marxist. It's something to do with the vehemence of his language. On the plane back from Bolivia, one reporter said to him, what about uh, middle class folk who work hard and pay their taxes? You don't seem to have much of a message for them. And the Pope said, oh, uh, it's been an error of mine not to have thought about that. Um, and he added with some considerable understatement, I've heard that there is some criticism in the United States. And he said, every criticism must be received, studied, and dialogue must follow. But the Pope's track record, it's pretty clear to me, uh, is telling us that we should not expect in the dialogue that follows uh, that the Pope's side will be placatory. I think you can expect harsh words. One of his top advisors said that uh, Francis's tone in the United States would be friendly but frank. And although he's committed to what he calls the culture of encounter, this first Pope from the Global South is unswerving in his commitment to the poor church for the poor and the perspective from which he views all of these problems. When he was Archbishop in uh, Buenos Aires in 2001, there was a big financial crisis. He'd had this experience of what it was like for poor people in the slums, but at this point, 2001, it was the biggest debt default in world history, and the Argentinian economy spiralled. Half the population was plunged below the poverty line. And economists from Washington came in from the IMF and the World Bank and said, you've got to do this, you've got to cut that, we need an austerity program. Um, and what happened was that the changes which were put in place to save the economy hit the very poorest people hardest. And that was when Francis, who had been quite critical of liberation theology in the early part of his career, began to address the fact that some of the systems, the economic systems, seem to be biased against poor people. And he began to talk more like a liberation theologian. And I think you need to know that, uh, again, when, when he comes to speak here. One of his aides said to me that, like many Latin Americans, Francis combines, this is regard, with regard to the United States, Francis combines a sense of respect and a feeling of resentment at the economic and cultural dominance of its bigger neighbor. So his background as a Latin American will, will, will be an important way of reading uh, the things he says when he comes here next week. So we have this, these, these two things, back to the balance. He will smile warmly at the uh, ordinary people that he meets, but the political leaders should expect some discomforting talk when he uh, makes his address to both the Houses of Congress and also to the UN. Uh, President Obama's already announced that on the, the agenda will be uh, immigration, uh, poverty, and homelessness. That's um, the Pope in Bolivia. And that's the demonstrations in Argentina. This is the Pope and Obama meeting at... Uh, um, the Vatican uh, recently. They agreed when he came this time that they would talk about immigration, poverty and homelessness. And immigration, of course, is now much more on the agenda with the refugee crisis. At one point on his visit, the Pope's going to use the lectern that uh, Lincoln used for the Gettysburg Address. And I think that will almost certainly prompt him to praise the founding ideals of the United States, but to perhaps ask why current politicians are not uh, um, well, are falling short of them. Because the other thing you've got to remember is with the Pope, the Pope will be here, he will be speaking to America, but he knows that the eyes and ears of the world and the poor world in particular will also be upon him. And he will speak truth to power in the UN as well, I think. 
Uh, he's already rebuked world leaders on uh, climate change for weak leadership and for failing in previous global summits. Another important thing you should know to read Francis next week is that the Pope is unafraid of confrontation uh, where he deems it necessary. So ahead of that environmental document, Laudato Si, the climate change lobby um, in the US in particular ran a campaign of, of articles which they called pre-bottles, uh, rebuttals in advance to try and put a, a kind of negative lens over the way that people would receive the document when it arrived. Uh, Francis was aware of this and to launch the document he recruited a top global warming expert uh, uh, who's called Hans Joachim Schellenhuber and this, he runs the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's one of the really top figures in this field. But he was, his selection was particularly defiant from the smiling Pope because Schellenhuber uh, is the man who described the population of the United States as climate illiterate. So to select him to present the papal document was, was fighting talk. Uh, he was hitting back at the pre-buttle people. The document itself shows that the Pope understands the importance of uh, networks of support because he could see that on the other side he'd got this unholy alliance of uh, free market politicians, uh, in oil industry apologists, fracking enthusiasts, climate change uh, deniers. So he decided he needed an equal alliance on the other side. So within the document itself, he took great care to cite uh, previous popes, including the two immediate past popes who are uh, well regarded by uh, conservatives, uh, he cited documents from no fewer than 18 bishops' conferences from around the world. He cited le leading orthodox theologians on green theology. And he, he cited the 97% of the world's scientists who've published on global warming and who've concluded that it is uh, largely created by human activity. And there was a certain irony in the last point because a lot of uh, Republican hopefuls had, had, had said to um, the Pope that he should leave science to the scientists. So he was leaving science to the scientists and uh, the scientists were, were um, pretty much uh, of, of one mind. Climate change in, in the United States is often presented as a kind of problem with, on the one hand it could be this and on the other hand it could be that. And it has to be said that's a distinctly U US viewpoint in the rest of the world. Uh, climate change is seen as uh, a definite problem and the debate is over how do we deal with it. Um, so the Pope is, is clearly uh, not, not in, in, in the mood to take any lessons on that. So the strategy behind all this was clear. To those who wanted to dismiss his document as you know, the work of a single communist-inspired maverick Pope, they were being sent a clear message, no, this is the voice of many people, not just one man. And he underscored that by um, uh, inviting Naomi Klein to uh, a Vatican platform to um, promote the document. Klein had written this book, um, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And what it says is almost exactly the same as what Laudato Si says, uh, that there is an economic problem at the heart of climate problems. Uh, and again, it's an economic dysfunctional system which puts profit before people and before the planet. And a Vatican spokesman introducing her very pointedly introduced her as a secular Jewish feminist. But uh, what the Pope was doing by, by doing that was asserting the, um, the, the, the boldness of, of, of the initiative, but also bringing, I mean, this is a Pope who gave lots of his early interviews to atheist newspaper editors in uh, um, in Italy. He's a man who thinks that um, you need to build alliances outside the, the Christian world and uh, with anybody uh, who you can find who, who you think is, is along the right lines. So again, a very tactical sense and you should watch for that. Um, when, when he issued the document, I'll just say in parenthesis, he showed this, his understanding of the subtlety of international politics. He timed it to influence three UN uh, summits, one on aid financing in Addis Ababa, which took place the month after. This one that's next week in, in the uh, UN General Assembly, which is on sustainable development goals. And then in December in Paris, there's a, a climate change conference. And this encyclical is clearly um, 
fired into the middle of all that in the hope of, uh, of stirring things up. At the UN, I expect his uh, speech to range across sustainable development, obviously, climate change, refugees and peace. But I've been told also you won't shy away from issues on which he disagrees with many UN members. One of these is population control. We know from the Pope's complex and even contradictory comments on contraception in the Philippines and elsewhere, on the one hand saying that human vitae and Pope uh, Paul VI was a prophetic document on contraception, on the other hand saying Catholics shouldn't breed like rabbits. So it's difficult sometimes to know exactly what his message is. But what is clear is that although he ends up in the same place as previous popes who were against contraception for philosophical reasons, theological reasons, talk about the natural law and so forth, uh, this pope gets to that conclusion by an entirely different route. He sees population control as a kind of mechanism by which rich people want to curb the numbers of poor people so that they can continue to uh, hog a unfair proportion of the, of the Earth's resources. The other thing I think he'll touch on in um, the UN uh, and possibly at the Congress too is, is the subject of abortion. But abortion in a different kind of way that it's been talked about before. It is a kind of exemplar of Francis's distinct approach. At the beginning of his papers, you might remember, he said that the Catholic Church had been too obsessed with uh, um, um, sexual issues uh, at, the, at the expense of concentrating on spreading, spreading the gospel. And this went down badly with uh, Catholics and Christians more generally for whom abortion had become a litmus test of, uh, of faith. Francis has got no patience with this and he will sidestep step any attempts to try and make him talk about abortion in the, uh, the old uh, culture wars confrontational style. Someone suggested he should pray uh, outside a, a US abortion clinic and he gave that fairly short shrift. It seems to me that his initiative widening the mercy on abortion was a, was a pretty eloquent response uh, to, to suggestions like that. What he'll do is he'll portray abortion as one symptom in this wider throwaway society which disposes of the weak and the old and the unemployed as well as the unborn. Anyone who's deemed surplus to the economy's requirements. And his view is that the church shouldn't be divided, as it often is, especially in the United States, into pro-life churches and social justice churches. He thinks that to be an environmentalist is pro-life and to protect the unborn is a social justice issue. It's harder to predict what the Pope's going to say when he meets the Catholic bishops. One of the most interesting um, moments of the Washington leg of that visit will come when he addresses 300 bishops in St. Matthew's Cathedral. And he's fairly sure to underline to them his views on the type of bishops and the type of priests that the church in America needs today. Uh, and the American bishops will probably find themselves, uh, like their counterparts in Brazil last year, being told to recruit priests who can warm people's hearts, the smell of the sheep in the famous phrase. Uh, they'll be told to empower lay people more, which is something that Francis is very keen on, um, especially women, one would hope, uh, although women is an issue which he seems to know what the problem is but not be sure what the solution is. And they'll be told to emphasise mercy and forgiveness rather than judgment and condemnation. And the bishops will know that, that Pope Francis often reserves his harshest words for the clerical elite. In Korea, he told the bishops to shed worldliness and power. In Paraguay, he warned them not to put themselves on a pedestal. And you may remember how last Christmas, when uh, the top bureaucrats in the church were gathering for the Christmas party and a little address by the Pope on how things had gone this year, instead of a cosy Christmas message, he subjected them to um, a, a scathing broadside and as it were, he listed the 15 spiritual diseases which they suffered from that he discovered in his time in the Vatican, including self-importance, lust for power and a lack of empathy for others. So to most outside observers, certainly to a Briton like me, uh, the church in the United States is perhaps um, the church the national church that is most bitterly and egregiously divided uh, and polarised on this issue of any church across the world. And I think bishops who have been part of that division and who've dedicated themselves to, the, to fighting 
uh, culture wars issues could easily find themselves being criticised by the Pope uh, at that meeting in, in St Matthew's Cathedral. The uh, more conservative US Catholic bishops, I think, have been bracing themselves for this criticism, um, speaking uh, or trying to head off such criticism as the bishops. The, the, um, this is um, Archbishop uh, Chapu from Philadelphia, and he was talking to religion reporters in Philadelphia recently, and he rejected the notion that US bishops had been more concerned with abortion and social justice. And he said that his diocese spent 20 times more on poverty and social justice issues than it does fighting abortion and contraception. Uh, and he said he thought that that was true of dioceses uh, throughout the United States. That is not a view which is universally accepted, it has to be said. And he concluded by saying, I hope when Pope Francis flies home, he'll understand that American bishops share every ounce of his passion for the poor, even if this doesn't fit to the narrative of compassionate Francis versus conservative American bishops. I think when Francis uh, flies home, he'll need to have seen quite a lot to be convinced of that. And I think if you need evidence of that, uh, you just need to know that the Pope uh, can handpick a number of the delegates who go to this Synod of the Bishops next month. And there are four um, bishops elected by the US Bishops Conference. To that, he's just added four names. Um, and they are um, Blaise Supich from Chicago, George Murray of um, Youngstown, Ohio. And he's also just added two figures who are seen as moderates, Cardinal World from Washington and uh, Cardinal Dolan from New York. Now, what is uh, the message I get from Rome is that these, these four men being added to the four who've been elected is a, is a clear signal by the Pope that he thinks that the, the, the US bishops uh, in the Catholic Church are not representative of the US Church. And he wants a more balanced, uh, a better balance of uh, US voices at the Synod. Uh, some conservatives have looked at this and said this is obviously uh, an attempt by the Pope to deliberately bias the Synod to people who share his own reconciliatory views of the church, how the church should treat um, the remarried gay couples, single mums, uh, and anybody else whose private life falls outside the ideal. Well, we'll see uh, about that, But because the Pope has picked some conservatives uh, too. But a number of people have repeated to me the same kind of metaphor, both in Rome and in Argentina, that this Pope is a chess player whose every step has been thought out. So it's interesting to, to watch that space, I think. What will have not escaped the notice of the US bishops is that uh, in the appointment of cardinals, uh, over the past two years, the Pope has appointed 39 cardinals, not one of them an American, and only a very few uh, from uh, Europe. Francis seems to be ignoring the unwritten tradition that dioceses like Chicago, Los Angeles, Philadelphia are always led by a cardinal. And Francis's view is that North America, like Europe, has got too many cardinals, and he's been appointing them from Tonga, Haiti, Vietnam, Burma, um, places uh, which uh, have never had cardinals in the past. So all of this leads the US bishops to, to, to know that their leverage on the universal church is under challenge. I'll tell you one final story uh, which illustrates that Francis's opponents would, would do well to note that he doesn't buckle in the face of opposition. One of the big jobs he's had in the first two years has been dealing with the Vatican Bank, which has become a byword for dysfunction and scandal. And to be his eyes and ears inside that reform process, he appointed this man, um, Montigna Battista Rica, who's a former papal diplomat, and his, his job was running the guest house in, uh, in Rome, where Francis used to stay when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Uh, so he was one of the, this man was one of the few people in Rome that Francis knew well when he came as a, a Latin American stranger uh, to be Pope. Uh, he liked Rica, he placed great confidence in him, so he put him inside the bank and gave him access uh, to, to every document. Um, this was not appreciated in the bank. Uh, within a month, um, they decided to get rid of him, and within a month of his appointment, this headline appeared in uh, an Italian newspaper um, claiming that Rica had been involved in homosexual affairs when he was a papal diplomat. 
and they claimed that he'd had an affair with a, a, a male captain in the Swiss army and uh, he'd taken this man uh, to Uruguay with him when he was a di diplomat. And the, uh, the, the papers were full of lurid headlines uh, about incidents from the man's past life. It was widely assumed that Rika would have to resign after all of this. Um, and Rika did offer his resignation. When he submitted it to the Pope, the Pope refused to accept it. The Pope decided that these leaks were a, an attempt by conservatives to deliberately undermine the reform program within the Vatican Bank. And it's significant that it was when he was questioned about Rika that uh, on, on the plane, you may, may remember this, this press conference, the Pope came up with this phrase that was like the defining phrase of early on, the early part of his papacy, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge was a question that he was answering about this man, Rika. It obviously has wider implications. It's interesting that we expect popes to make statements, but here he was asking a question and not suggesting that there is no judgment, but suggesting that the judgment is beyond the pope perhaps with the wider church or perhaps just leave it to God. But these stern words that the Pope uh, uh, has given to the clerical elite uh, will, will reinforce amongst US Catholic bishops the fear that he's going to come and say the same thing to them and that his message about their past performance will be admonitory rather than laudatory. Uh, this is uh, Archbishop Kurtz, who's the... Uh, president of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops and when he was asked about what he hoped for from the Pope's visit he said one of my fondest hopes is that I enjoy his visit <laughs> as though the possibility had crossed his mind that he might not <clears throat> but there seems little doubt that the people of America will see the smile of Pope Francis and they will be warmly embraced by him when ordinary Catholics in the pews are asked what they like about Francis, they always answer his smile, his warmth, his simplicity, his humility, uh, his audacity, his radiant happiness, his sense of liberation, his sense of humour, and his deep respect for people of other denominations, other faiths, and even for atheists. And above all, people cite his ordin ordinariness. They say he's one of us. Of course, he's... an. He's extraordinary in his ordinariness. Um, this is a pope of paradox, and, and they do perceive in him both that deep personal integrity and a lifestyle so simple as to be severe, but yet not puritanical. And He's a man charged with joy. And um, I spoke to a pilgrim in, when I was writing the book in, in um, St. Peter's Square, and he said, he walks the walk as well as talking the talk. He's a priest who practices what he preaches. So I think you can expect uh, any fall in Pope Francis' popular popularity ratings to be pretty dramatically reversed once he sets foot on American soil. Last weekend, this is to conclude, he um, was asked if he had a message for the people of America. I'm not sure how that slide's crept in there. It's nice though, isn't it? Um, and he said, it's very important for me to meet with you, the citizens of the United States, who have, and any Catholic will know that there's a, an echo of the famous Vatican II um, document, Gaudium et Spes, in these words. This is the opening document, uh, the op opening words of that famous document. He says, The citizens of the United States who have your history, your cultures, your virtues, your joys, your sadness, your problems, just like anyone else, and sorry, just like everyone else, this trip is important for me to draw close to you and to your path just like everyone else. The ordinary people of America are no more important to the Pope than the people elsewhere around the world, but they are no less important. And I predict that the memorable moments of this visit will be not when he meets the great and the good, but when he meets ordinary people, encounters with the young, homeless, the mentally ill, immigrants, prisoners, and perhaps even the victims of sex abuse, though we probably won't know about that until after it's happened. In that document, Laudato Si, the Pope wrote, all it takes is one good person to restore hope. And perhaps for the United States of America, that one person will be Pope Francis. Thank you.